Now you know I like containers, and I've containerized most workloads in my environment. But what about something big and crazy, like a desktop? Yeah, a Linux desktop. Hmm, maybe Ubuntu or Alpine? And a GUI, where you can choose XFCE, KDE, Mate, or i3. Then, what if we could persist it and install anything we want? And while we're at it, just throw it all inside of a browser. Well. Linuxserver.io has already done it, and it's called a webtop. A webtop is an Ubuntu or Alpine Linux with a full desktop environment inside of a browser. With a webtop, you can access any of the standard features you would expect inside of Linux, and you can install and configure any software you like. And the nice thing about Linuxserver.io's webtop is that you get a window manager, you get pixel-perfect rendering, you have access to the clipboard, and you get audio. And this is perfect if you want a lightweight Linux desktop for web browsing, or some network tools, or terminal utilities. But let's see if we can install some more demanding applications like VLC, LibreOffice, or even develop some code using VS Code. And let's really try to push this desktop that's inside of a container, that's inside of a browser, to its limits. And if that sounds good to you, give this video a thumbs up and let's continue to configure it. So how are we going to do this? Since it is a container, we can run this inside of any containerization technology. Want to run it with plain old Docker and Compose? Fine. Want to run it with Portainer? Great. Want to run it in Kubernetes with or without Rancher? Awesome. And so how you choose to run this is really going to be up to you. But we'll cover the configuration that applies to all of these containerization technologies so that you're covered whatever platform you choose. And like all my other videos, I'll share my entire configuration with you, so be sure to check the description for a link. The first thing we'll need to do is go out to linuxserver.io. Linuxserver.io hosts many Docker images, and I use a lot of them in my environment. Once you're there, you'll want to find the webtop image. And if you scroll down to usage, we'll see how to create this container. And this image has a lot of standard properties that you see across all of their images. But it has some additional flags and tags along with environment variables, so let's cover those real quick. And if you're doing this in Docker or Docker Compose, you can either use the Docker Compose syntax of this YAML, or you can use the Docker CLI to spin this up. And if you're using Rancher or Portainer, you'll just fill in the form with these values. So in this YAML file, we'll see the name of our service. We're calling it WebTop here. We have an image that points to our container image. We can name the container here. We can state whether or not we want it privileged, and we'll talk about this here in a little bit. Then we have some environment variables. These are typical ones we see, PUID and PGID. I'll tell you how to get those here in a second too. But these map to IDs and groups that we're gonna run this container as. And this really just helps out with permissions. Then we're gonna set a time zone. You would fill in yours here. Then we're gonna map some volumes. So the first volume is gonna be a path to your config on the machine. And this really is a path to your home directory. We'll show you that. And the second path is optional. And this is a mapping back to the Docker socket. Now, you probably won't need this at all. This is so your container would actually have access to Docker. But we're not gonna do that. We don't need Docker inside of Docker, inside of Docker, I think, again, or, or something like that. But we don't need Docker in this container. So we can ignore that. But if you do, here's where you do it. Then we're gonna map some ports, 3000 on the outside and 3000 on the inside. Then we're gonna set the SHM size. And so this is memory that you can dedicate to this container. They recommend one gig so that I think the browser doesn't crash. We're actually gonna go a little bit higher so we can run some more applications. And restart and less stop. This is typical stuff we see in all their images. This will restart the container if it crashes. If you stop it yourself, it'll stay stopped. And so really, that's all we need to spin up this container. So after that, you'll want to remote into your server. You want to make sure that you have Docker running on this machine. And if you run a Docker dash dash version, you should see an output there. And if you're going to run this with any other containerization platform or use Containerd or use Kubernetes, you probably don't need Docker and you probably know what to do. But just make sure that your containerization engine is running. And if you plan on running this with Docker Compose, check to make sure that you have Docker Compose running. If you need help with those, I'll have those in my documentation too. The next thing you'll want to do is create a folder for the service. So I'll make a folder called WebTop, and then we'll CD into WebTop. Then we'll create a file for our Docker Compose configuration. Then we'll edit this Docker Compose file. And in here, I'm going to paste these contents. So let's talk about this really quick. 
So we already talked about most things, but we need to cover a few more things. So in the image, you can see that I'm using WebTop, but I'm also using this tag, Ubuntu Mate. So Ubuntu Mate is another flavor of Ubuntu. But how did I know that this exists? Well, if we go back to linuxserver.io and look at their version tags, they actually tag their images with the flavor of Ubuntu or Alpine Linux that you want to run. So this is really awesome. So if you want to run latest and don't supply a tag at all, you're going to get XFCE Alpine Linux. But if you want Ubuntu and XFCE, you would just add this tag here. If you wanted Alpine and KDE, you would add this one. Ubuntu and KDE, you would add this one. Alpine and i3, you would add this one. And so they support lots of versions of Linux, which is pretty awesome. I'm choosing Ubuntu Mate because, well, I want to. And that's just because I like Ubuntu and I like Mate. What else is there to say? But do know, there are some quirks if you choose some of the others. Remember how I said this privilege flag is optional? Well, it's actually required if you choose a few of these tags. So they say right here, the KDE and i3 flavors for Ubuntu need to be run in privilege mode to function properly. So if you're gonna run either of those two, your container needs to run in privilege mode. But if you're not like me, and you're gonna run Ubuntu Mate, it doesn't need to be privileged. And so back to our Docker Compose YAML. I mentioned that we'd have to figure out what our PUID and our PGID is. And that's as simple as going into your server, typing an ID and grabbing the values here. So for me, it's 1000. Next is setting your time zone. We talked about that, set that to your own time zone. And volumes, we need to set this. It's gonna be a path to slash config within the container to a path on our server. And so inside of our web top folder, let's create a folder called config, and then let's get the path to our config and we'll update this line for volumes. And I get it, I could use a relative path here, but I'm so used to using absolute paths, but if you wanna use a relative path, feel free to. Next, we're gonna keep the ports the same. Unless you have a port conflict, you wanna change it, but 3000 is good for me. And here's the SHM size. And so they recommend one gig, we're gonna go two gig because we're gonna to try to push this to its limits. And then next is something that we didn't mention, but it's actually an EMV file. So a .EMV file is a way to specify secrets so the container can use them without putting your secrets as environment variables. So let's say for instance, we have a password environment variable, which this does support, and we wanna set the password to a super secret password, but we don't want other people to see it, and we don't want the container to show it, and we don't wanna commit it to a repo. Well, using an EMV file is a way to solve that. And so this is the password you'll use to log into the website to get into your containerized desktop. The default is ABC, but if you wanna change it, you can either use an environment variable here of password, or you can delete that, specify an EMV file property, specify an EMV file, create an EMV file, specify your variable, and then specify the value. So there's a couple of ways that you can do that. But for this, I'm gonna comment it out and we're gonna use ABC. But I highly recommend not to set this as ABC. So let's copy this and edit our Docker Compose file and paste this in. And then we'll save it. And then we should be able to run docker-compose up-d. And now it's pulling down that image. Now it's extracting that image. And now it instantiated the image. So now let's go out to the IP address or the DNS name if you have one on port 3000 where we're hosting this container. And here we go. <laughs> Pretty awesome. We're inside of a browser that's inside of a container that is a desktop operating system. And so you can see here, we can launch Firefox, run Firefox. Go to my website and it loads. We can launch a terminal and we have terminal access and see the ABC there. That's what I was talking about. So the default account for this is ABC slash ABC. And they make it really clear that they're not trying to make this an ultra hardened secured environment because after all, we're running a whole entire operating system within a container on top of another operating system. But that also means it shouldn't be exposed to the internet. They make that really clear too. But this is fantastic for behind the firewall if you VPN in. And so we can do a lot of the normal Linux stuff. So we can update it, upgrade our packages. 
Which, while we're on the upgrade topic, this is probably a good point to talk about this. So typically with containers, you update the container base image. When a new version is released, if there's a new tag like latest gets updated, or a version tag like 1.1.1 gets updated, you normally want to update your container that's running to the latest image. But you don't with this one. This one's a little bit different. Linux server actually recommends to not do that. And once you instantiate this container based on that image, you update everything within the container. And if you end up updating the actual image for the container, you'll lose a lot of your changes. You won't lose anything in your documents folder or your home folder, but you will lose any changes within the operating system. So you've been warned, once you go this container route, keep it patched and updated within the container instead of updating the image itself. So anyways, that's my PSA. So let's try to install some stuff. So let's install VLC. And while that's going, let's download a test video and then let's open VLC. And let's try opening a file. It's pretty awesome. 1080p video playing there. Looks pretty good. Now I will say that you, this is probably not something you're gonna watch movies on or watch YouTube on, but it will play videos as you just saw. You can see as it gets bigger, the frame rate kind of drops. Next, let's install something else. Let's install something big, something to be productive. Like we're gonna make some slides or work on some spreadsheets or do something Office-like. I know, let's install LibreOffice. That might take some time, that's about a gig. So while that's installing, let's do some other stuff. What are some other things I like to do on the go really quick? I like to write code, so let's grab VS Code. And even if you're not a programmer, VS Code is a fantastic editor. So let's download this. And while that's still installing, let's go into our downloads. See, we have VS Code. Let's install it manually. And it's locked, so we might need to wait. And there we go, that's done. So let's install that. And while that's installing, let's check out LibreOffice. So we'll open Calc, and you can see here, We can edit spreadsheets. Let's open up Impress or presentation software like PowerPoint. We can create a presentation. Use a containerized desktop within a browser. Sounds like a snoozer. <laughs> okay, and since that's done, let's open up VS Code. I know what happened. We might be missing some dependencies. Oh, we're not. I guess not. So let's open it. And so I think I just found another use case for the privilege flag. So after trying to get VS Code to launch quite a few times, I couldn't get it to launch. And then I thought, well, maybe I'll launch it from the terminal. And from the terminal, it wouldn't launch either. And then I found that I could use code dash dash verbose and it outputted an error. And after looking up this error, it looks like I'm gonna need to run this in privileged mode. So let's do that really quick. So to do that in the Docker compose file, we just need to add the flag here. Let's save it and let's recreate it. And now we can run VS Code. So if you find an application isn't launching the way it should, you might wanna to try to run this as privileged mode. So anyways, let's go back to VS Code, choose dark mode, always dark mode. Uh, playground, split editor, mark is done. Cool, we have VS Code running. Let's write some code real quick. But before we do, I actually need to install Node really quick. So I use MVM, which helps me manage Node. Close out, open up. MVM, MVM install. 14.16.1, uh, sounds good. Node-v, I have node. Let's go back to VS Code, see if we can open a terminal. And we have a terminal. So this is really mind boggling. A terminal inside of VS Code that's inside of a desktop that's containerized inside of a browser. Uh, so let's write some code real quick. Say file, new file. First, let's zoom in for you. Awesome. Change it to JavaScript. I'm gonna say const message equals hello from 
inside of a container. Log out this message. Hit F5 to debug. It's like we need to save. Sure, hello.js. Launch it in node. And here we are, hello inside of a container. Let's just set a breakpoint, just to prove. There we go, and our message, Messag. Hello from inside of a container, awesome. So we can develop software inside of this container too. And you can do lots of other things too. If, if you're not a programmer and you just want a quick desktop to run some network utilities, you can. You can ping google.com, but you can't ping google.com yet because we need to install ping. That's the other thing about this container. It's super lightweight, which is a good thing. But you'll need to install some of the utilities you would normally find within this desktop operating system too. I think it's IP utils ping. Yeah, it is. Now we should be able to ping google.com. Or if you want to do an NS lookup on google.com, you can't do that either because we need to install it. DNS utils, I think. Yeah, there we go. DNS utils. And it's look up google.com and we get a response. So again, that's just something to keep in mind. You might not have all of the normal utilities you would find in a full desktop operating system, but it's simple enough to install them. And I'd rather have this small and lightweight than include everything along with it and take on all of the requirements just for some simple utilities. And so I think we proved out a lot of the things that we wanted to see. I honestly don't think we've pushed this to the limits yet, but we've installed office utilities, video utilities, networking utilities, VS Code, wrote some code. And so you can see how powerful this is. And so what do you think of web tops? Are you gonna install at a web top in your containerization platform or just stick with virtual machines? Do you see the use case for this? Say, if you're only running a containerization platform to be able to spin up a desktop and get to a GUI environment. Or again, are you just gonna stick to virtual machines? If so, let me know in the comments section below. And remember, if you found anything in this video helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Do processes and technologies you establish in your home lab end up also finding their way into your company? Yeah, great question. Great question. I feel like I'm in an interview. Um, yeah, great question. Uh, I would say absolutely yes. I think it goes both ways. It goes both ways. You know, there are things I figure out or someone else figures out at work and I'm like, hey, that's either a great pattern, a great strategy or a great fix or, a, you know, a great feature. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm totally going to do that at home now. And, uh, you know, I apply it to my home lab. And then there are other times where I'm ahead of work where I'm like, okay, I want to... Uh, basically what I was talking about earlier, patching using shared images um, for Docker containers and then using those for build containers and then using those at build time. You know, there are times when I figure out things home at home and, um, you know, I bring them into work. Um, it happens quite a bit. 